our last presenter of the day is going to be Frank White. And um, I'm looking at, and I want to add a little bit more to what you see in his bio in the programs. I, I believe that I know Frank White mostly for his knowledge and passion for what is and was the Rondo neighborhood. But I believe from listening to him talk that he is most proud of the activities that he does with coordinating with the RBI or the Reviving Baseball in inner cities. And, and he is very passionate about that work that he does. Um, and I will also say that he is best known for being the author of the book, They Played for the Love of the Game, Untold Stories of Black Baseball in Minnesota. So let's give a big welcome to Frank White. Uh, uh, well, I, I really appreciate being here. Thank you so much for, for having me and, and for the presenters in front of me because I have a passion also for history. I, I've learned some additional things and, and so uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that I'm, I'm here. Um, I often tell people about the book really quick is like, I, when people kept asking me in the beginning, a couple of people said, oh, you got to do a book. I said, I don't want to do a book. I don't want to do a book. And, and finally, I, I did because I've been fortunate to listen to individuals that played with my father, and they were oral interviews. And if I never shared them, they would have been lost forever. So, so that was the reason of the book. I don't think I'm a writer. I think I'm a storyteller. <laughs> so I hope I can share a couple stories with you uh, here today. Uh, quickly, um, Larry showed a, a photo of the Globe Building, which was at 4th and Cedar. And so connected to black baseball at 3rd and Cedar in downtown St. Paul, which is Kellogg Boulevard today, um, was Phil Reed's saloon. And then at that, at, at, at Kellogg, and if you can imagine it today, because now you can walk straight out and it's flat, but there were actually went down to Second Street, which goes kind of underneath the, the bluff there, if you can imagine what that is. So that Globe Building <coughs> uh, really stands out for me, again, a connection to the St. Paul Colored Gophers and, and uh, Phil Reed. And then the Aurora Grounds, my m many years later, that when I was about 12, that was my paper route. <laughs> so, okay, so let me, uh, uh oh, let me, I'm gonna hit a button here and I don't, I'm not sure which one. To the, ah, there we go. Oops. Sorry, I should have done this ahead of time. Help, 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 I'm sorry. Yes. I don't, I'm not sure which. So you should be able to do this. This one. Yeah, this that. one. Yay! Sorry, so I didn't. I didn't ask. Sorry. Um, so to begin with, if, if for me again in my passion about one of the other things is that I'm I'm also working on a number of projects in addition to my continual research on black baseball, is the uh, the increase in the awareness of African American history. In, in Minnesota. So this is just a quick little glimpse uh, a, again of a time period to when we became a state that's been mentioned a couple times today. And so um, obviously there weren't supposed to be any slaves here when the fort was built, but there were. So quick, James Thompson was the first one. So Todd Peterson in his book uh, shared this information here and uh, again about the, the interest he thought in terms of, of baseball and, and its beginning and, and, and where maybe black baseball began or baseball in itself. <clears throat> Supposedly our first documented African American player in, in Minnesota is Prince Honeycutt and uh, a photo of him here in front of his barbershop. 
in Fergus Falls, and uh, he helped start uh, the Fergus Falls North Steiners team. Later, I think they became a year or two later, they became called the Musculars, if, if any of you have done any of that information. So the first documented game between black teams uh, in 1876 was the unions of Minis uh, Minneapolis defeated the Blue Stars of St. Paul, 37 to 28. I keep hearing throughout today those scores, and I'm thinking, wow. So <laughs> were those football games or, <laughs> or basketball games? Uh, and then a few weeks later, it says that the Blue Stars would get revenge when they beat the unions. And then there was the, the accusation that W.W. Fisher, I think uh, Stu mentioned him earlier again, that he was a professional player from Chicago. So they actually literally walked off the field and didn't finish the game. W.W. Um, Fisher also played in Winona for, I think, a team called the Clippers on and off, again, an all-white team, not an all-black team. A number of these, uh, because of the time period, a number of the African-American players that played in Minnesota obviously were playing for, for many of them for white baseball teams. Um, in addition to that, a number of these games <coughs> would also be played at large social events like celebrations, like picnics, and, uh, and played at Excelsior Park. Um, west of, of, of Minneapolis or whatever. So in, in a lot of times they would be baseball games that were played more, more for fun, but I think what it says to me is baseball was one of those activities that was enjoyable for African Americans in addition to Germans, whites, et, et cetera, da, 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 right? So again, it was, even though they maybe weren't organized games, just like everybody else, they were playing the game. Bud Fowler, who was also mentioned, uh, uh, there are some things there, again, to take a look at, and, and actually signed in, and played in Stillwater in 1884, which at the time was that Northwestern League that filled, or excuse me, that, oh, that Stu talked about, I don't know where I got that from, where Stu talked about earlier, sorry. And I think one of the teams that, again, that he ended up playing for in Keokuk, um, it, which is actually this photo that you can see here. Um, outstanding baseball player. Um, for, for me, it, during all of this time, and I think Larry talked about it earlier as well as maybe a couple others, you know, as Minnesota was growing, it was, I couldn't understand what the connection was to Chicago. Until uh, I did research in, in the black newspapers, I would see that right before the turn of the century, there were like six daily trains that went to Chicago from St. Paul or from the Twin Cities. So there was a real obvious connection and then because of red caps and that type of stuff, uh, they were important or significant to communication with other individuals, people going back and forth, coming and, and when they first got off the, if you can imagine getting off the train, for African American people, they were probably the red caps, uh, the porters were the first people they talked about where do I go to live and that type of stuff or whatever. So it was extremely important to communication, again, for African-American people. Here I've listed some of the places, again, that Bud, Bud Fowler uh, actually played. Obviously, there were more. Those were just a few of the places here. Again, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, games played in Excelsior, again, at one of those events, the picnics and that type of stuff, celebrations. Um, here, the brown, stock, brown stockings accept a challenge uh, for the quick steps and, and then would win the game and, and, and say they were the champions of the Northwest. The quick steps also would play a, a team at Fort Snelling and then would go on to play Shakopee Reserves. So they continued to play games as people became more organized, just like the other teams, other organizations. Everybody was looking to play this great game of baseball um, at, at this time in the 19th century as we were moving into the 20th century. Here's another baseball team, the Little Diamonds. 
everybody was challenging everybody. And we've heard that, that theme throughout the day uh, about people wanting to play the best teams, somebody else again to, to increase their, their, their legacy in the game of baseball. And it was no different for African American teams. As we head into the 20th century, probably uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the significant baseball players is Billy Williams, uh, born in St. Paul in 1877. Uh, here is a photo, if you saw this whole team photo, <clears throat> he actually played for, in 1893, the Spaldings. So he was like 16 years old at that time. They were one of the best teams in St. Paul, as well as the Hams experts in 1895, it in essence is the same team. If you look down here at, at the bottom of the photo, um, uh, it, it's the same team and Billy played and they said he was prominently displayed in the center of the picture. I'm actually working with uh, some people at the Capitol right now. Um, we are intending to do um, a celebration and an exhibit and a display on Billy Williams. Uh, some of you may know that as he continue, uh, continues on into the 20th century, he actually becomes probably the longest tenured employee at the state capitol. He goes on to work for 14 governors uh, from about 1905 until about uh, 1950. 55 or something like that. So I'm working with uh, people because again, here's an African American. Not only was it a great athlete, he, not only was he a great baseball player, but they talk about him being a football and a track star. He won a uh, set a record in the shot put, that type of stuff. But again, to go on and have an influence and in working for 14 governors uh, says to me that he was pretty influential again uh, with what was going on at the state capitol. If you went to see the governor, you actually had to see and talk to Billy Williams first. Some people didn't get to see the governor. So again, there's another aspect of his influence again at the Capitol. And, and I think it deserves recognition. Uh, and uh, so I'm working on that right now. And, I, and, and, and I've been told it's gonna happen. We just haven't put all of the, the dotted the I's and that type of stuff, but it's going to be, uh, before the baseball season opens. So I'm hoping it's gonna be like maybe um, April. Um, I hope we get beyond March because again, with kids coming through the Capitol and, and people coming through at a nicer time, weather-wise, we, I want more people to see the event. So hopefully that's going to get solidified here shortly and we will make that happen. The other individual, again, that is, is one of the names probably in baseball and black baseball is Walter Ball, who also born in Detroit but moved here when he was eight years old. He became quite a ball player as he was growing up. Um, two of the teams that he played with as a, as a teenager or a young guy was Funks Exports and the Young Slycones. Quite an impressive pitcher and, and um, if you know anything about Walter Ball, again, he has a, a great history in baseball, but he is also the individual that Walter, that, excuse me, Phil Reed hires to go to Chicago to hire the fastest, the best baseball players he can find and bring them back to St. Paul, and they became the St. Paul Colored Gophers or the St. Paul Gophers depending upon which way you want to reference them. So it's, it's significant to me, it's interesting to me that Comiskey goes to Chicago with the St. Paul Saints and they become the White Sox and Phil Reed recruits all of the players from Chicago to become the St. Paul Gophers. So another little tidbit, right? <laughs> For me anyway. I think uh, Larry talked again about in 1880 and 1890, the, the, the boom and, and what was going on here in Minnesota. And, and so I thought for me, I would include again what was happening in 1900. In about 1880s, there were 
probably less than 500 African Americans that lived in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So in the Twin Cities, about 1,000. So by the census of 1900, you can see things began to change. And then in 1910, it, it's almost to a point of where it's uh, really beginning to, to take shape, but still a very small percentage of the population here in Minnesota. So I wanted to kind of quickly go through this and, 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 and provide some time, hopefully, for uh, some, some questions, if you have any. I, I didn't want to tell you a whole bunch of stories about all of those individual players for two reasons. One, I knew I was going to be at the end of the day, <laughs> and, and people would be wanting to get out of here, I'm sure. So, But I am open to questions. Uh, I, I kind of rushed through that and uh, appreciate it wasn't trying trying to get through this i'm here and i will tend to ask or ask excuse me i will ask or answer questions frank what can you tell us about the ballparks where these uh these teams would play in the minneapolis area um they were um i i i, I think that uh, <clears throat> Chair Anderson already shared some of those places, and uh, I, I think um, some of the places where, the, whether it was the Aurora grounds, you know, they, those were were beginning. But some of the same places that were already discussed in the in the seventies, the eighties, um, were the only places that were really around to play, um, and uh, so people were using the same ballparks. Uh, just at different times or when they could get in there. Sometimes it would be just as she, as, excuse me, Chair Anderson said, it's, it was just the open spaces. And, and so I don't know that there was any difference of where they would play. And that would go on into, even into the 20th century, you know, uh, teams played at the, at, uh, the Down Down Ballpark. The, the series between the Gophers and the Leland Giants was at downtown ballpark in downtown St. Paul. So they got in there, or it was at Lexington ballpark or Nicollet ballpark. So they were the same stadiums. They weren't different stadiums. There were some areas, uh, again, it, as we move into some of the parks and recreation park, uh, whether it was parade stadium, or excuse me, the parade grounds, the polo grounds, that kind of stuff, or at the fort, the polo grounds, so. There weren't, there weren't different ballparks. Yes? I, uh, I, I have no idea. I, like, like you, when I first saw that, I was like, um, okay, what? And, and now maybe somebody else has an answer to that. Yes. Frank. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, he, I, you have an answer to that, I yeah. think, right? I apologize for jumping in, but I'm pretty sure Brent Peterson, the director of the Washington County Historical Society, probably has a pretty good idea or exact idea how that happened. Because I, I spent 20 minutes with him on the phone, and he just couldn't stop talking about the 1880-14. If, if you want to know about Bud Fowler, I called Brent <laughs> at the Washington uh, County Historic Society. He is he is uh, m much more of an expert about Bud Fowler than than I am for sure. So I would agree. So I wish I had a better answer for you. I I really don't. Frank, what uh, real quick, quickly, uh, quickly, uh, what is your background in baseball or family background in baseball? Players in your family or you yourself, way back when? You know your your beginnings in terms of loving the sport of baseball? Um, <laughs> darn it, Chair Anderson. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I started playing uh, uh, baseball probably at about 10 years old and, and um, always wanting to be my father. My, and, and at the time when I was 10, I didn't really know how good my father was. I would only found out, find out later on um, from other individuals or looking at his, his yearbooks in high school that my father was 
a, a, an outstanding athlete. He he was all conference in in three sports in high school. Uh, I was told by many that had the Big Ten and other Division One schools been offering uh, scholarships, he surely would have gotten one. Um, he he was also recruited by the Yankees. Uh, so I was I was fortunate, and also I have an, on my website I have a, an interview with Buck O'Neill and my father in the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, and uh, where Buck talks about they tried to recruit my father out of high school because he uh, they had played when they used to come through here they would pick up my father to play, and uh, and in 19 or excuse me in 46 when he graduated he set a record. Uh, winning the batting title for the St. Paul City Conference with a mere 600. So, so my dad was was a pretty good ball player. I always wanted to be like him. I, I uh, uh, a couple of those ball field uh, descriptions up there reminded me when I played at the Ober Boys Club uh, as a kid. It was a it was a city block, right? So the corner the ball field would be in this corner here. Left field would be a block away. Right field was the short block away. So on the, my best days when, you know, you really crushed one, <laughs> the outfielder would be sitting there going, because <laughs> I wasn't hitting it a block away, right? But some of my buddies that were left-handed <laughs> would hit it out over the fence and, and hit home run. So, so we played ball every day. I played in high school. Um, and by the time I left school, I had changed to basketball um, and uh, – and and I, we didn't have much, so my I couldn't afford uh, going to college. I got I I got a, a grant to go to uh, Hamlin for five hundred bucks, but I think tuition and books was like thirteen hundred dollars. And back in the '60s, there was nowhere to make eight hundred dollars over a summer. Um, so I ended up going into the Air Force. Came back, walked down at the U. It's where I met uh, Steve Winfield and and uh, David. And then some years about, well, I just finished my 18th year with the Twins. So for 18 years, I've been back in the game of baseball. I love it. Um, I, I, I don't think there is a better feeling in sports than when you get the whole ball when you're at bat, when you get the whole ball with a wooden bat. <laughs> with a wooden bat, right? So, so that's kind of my connection to the game. Uh, I'm back in. I've been coaching again for that same time period and administering the RVI program. So, thank you. Time yes. for a couple more questions. Sure. Um, I, you know, there is some mention. Um, I, I know there are, are individuals that play. There are some teams, um, and, and I'm not up to speed on who those. Um, I and and that and and that very well be. I, what town are you in? Okay. We, we there is some ongoing. Our chapter members are are looking into this. Okay, I you know I I was just up uh, this week. I was just up at Red Lake, uh, uh, and we had done a a a basketball officials uh, clinic at Faustin, but we went to Red Lake. And one of the interesting things, as you mentioned this, is when, we, when I went into the school to meet with the superintendent, there were three of us, um, she mentioned to us that we had just walked into a sovereign nation. There are 11 sovereign nations, Native American sovereign nations in Minnesota. I, I've never looked at it like that. So... Um, most people refer to reservations, which is true, but as a sovereign nation, it takes on a whole different 
meaning. Uh, so, so again, as you mentioned that, uh, I, I, I will begin to endeavor into that, not so much in baseball though, just for my own purposes to history, so. Okay, thank you, Frank. All right, thank you. You just didn't want to do the parade across the front of the stage. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, we have many groups that need to be thanked, including um, the Sabre Committee on the 19th Century that is the, the top organization that was involved in all of this, and they're the ones with the checkbook. Also, the library here, the Minnesota History Center, and the board members from the uh, local chapter, the Halsey Hall chapter, and the research committee, all of these people, there's too many people to name individually, and I know we all want to get going. I also would like you, you are all invited to join us going to the old Milwaukee Road Depot where there is a restaurant, and the restaurant is called the Milwaukee Road Restaurant. It's just down Washington Avenue, this away, that way. And um, you turn into, if you turn on Fifth Avenue going towards the river or south, then you can, I'm sorry, north, the other south. Thank you. <laughs> Go north and, and, and then you just park underneath. That's probably the most expensive place to park over there, but it is my favorite. If you haven't been by the depot, it's really kind of cool. They got all these statues that are ghosts from the past that are haunting the old Milwaukee Road Depot. Thank you. You can get up and go. <laughs>